sort of uh, casually mentioning in the lead up to this. Uh, we started out two years ago as a visioning project for the region, and the idea being to find out not only what people wanted this region to be in the future, but also what we could do to make that a reality. We, we started out with a question to uh, the residents of the region. By the way, we define region as basically everything in this county east of three points. So north to south and then three points in east of this metro area that we live in of about one million people right now. And we asked uh, the one million residents what they would like uh, or how they would like to see the next million people to come to our valley live. And whether that was in 20 years or 100 years, uh, we weren't worried about time. We just wanted to have a plan. And if we, what we found out was that people want choices, more choices than we have now. We are losing our 20-something generation because they don't want to live here. This is not a space that the, this, we haven't built the environment that they want to have. Uh, and as a result of that, not only are there no jobs for them, but our prospects for attracting new industries and new jobs are pretty limited because it's hard to bring the 30 and the 40-year-olds that also would like to have different space. So it was all about choices. It was all about choices in housing and types of housing and locations of housing, choices for transit and transportation, choices for just the way we live and, and how we live and how those communities look and access to them. So if you're going to talk about change, you have to have a way to measure that change. And specifically today, I'm going to introduce you to our Tucson Regional Indicators Project, which grew out of this conversation with the community because we had to show where we were. We had to be able to show a mirror up to them to say, hey, this this isn't right, or is this really how you want to live? The goals were to help assess the current uh, status, identify the priority areas that we wanted to focus on, where are things good, where are they not going well, and then express that information in a way to everyone that they could use for their own purposes, that they could use to monitor our progress, that they could use to help us engage and engage with us. So, we're going to go over some very briefly, just the structure of the thing so you know what we're getting into. The very first sets of questions we started over two years ago were to the community asking them what is it they valued. And we got 60 responses. Well, we had 33,000 responses, but we had 60 common uh, values that people all shared. Now, that's 60 is a big box of things. Uh, so we organized it into nine value areas. And if you look on the, in the brochures, you'll see the nine value areas uh, outlined there. Actually, this is the brochure. Oh, yeah, they are right there. So accessibility, uh, educational excellence. And we have education on there twice because we were talking about not only the primary and secondary that all of our children go through, but then the fact that we value our universities and our uh, FEMA Community College and the higher education as well. Quality neighborhoods. And what does that mean? Prosperity. Economic development is key. We are not the drivers of economic development. We know that if we create a space that values these things, we will have economic development. Good governance. Good heavens. We, we, we run into that every single day, don't we? Um, we hear about it in the newspaper every single day, how something is failing. But what we're trying to do by engaging the community is to help them actually develop that rapport with government that they need and reinstill some of that, uh, that feeling for it. So those are the things that, that's how we've organized this site as well. What are the indicators that show if we're achieving good governance or excellence in education or good neighborhoods, quality neighborhoods? Now what you're seeing, going to see is a, indeed a work of progress. Uh, so what I'm asking you to do, especially on that second form, is give us your feedback. And you don't have to do it today. Uh, but we're happy for you to take the website home with you, take a look at it, play with it, go through the data, and then give us feedback. You can do it by email, you can call us up, you can come in and have a chat with us face to face if you like, we're happy for that. But the site itself, as I said, is, is wrapped around those nine principal areas, those nine value areas that you, you've got in the hand out there. And you can drill down into them uh, just by hitting on the links. In a moment, we'll go through each one. But you can see, if you go to, say, the accessibility link and you scan down, there are seven of those 60 values that are assigned to the accessibility. <laughs> and you can drill down into each one of those. And each area is, is organized that way. And just for fun, you can take a look and see, all right, travel time to work, for instance, that's an indicator there for us. 
how long does it actually take by place throughout this region to get from average time from work? And that's broken down. The data, by the way, that we use to generate this comes mostly from the uh, American Community Survey and, and government sources like that, government and academic sources. So there are some pieces of here where it's straight data. You just you get an answer. Uh, there are some areas where it is more driven by analysis. And you can argue about our analysis. You don't have to agree with us there. But the data that's underlying, that's fact. And that's just, the, and, and we've tried to stay true to that. Okay, so the ground rules. Everyone's respected, of course. This is a conversation. At this point, it'll go two-way, I'm hoping. Uh, everyone should participate uh, and, of course, share the floor. And then uh, tell us how you feel about it as well. It doesn't have to be strictly driven by the fact. If there's, a, like, for instance, the perception of how these things are coming across, or as they told us at the, uh, the last time I held this conversation, it was just a bit too academic and not accessible enough for the average person, let us know that. Uh, and we're just looking for ideas. Uh, we don't, good, bad, or indifferent, put it out there and give it to us and we'll see how it matches up with the other conversations we've had with people across the region. Now, moving forward, uh, of course I want your, your feedback today, but moving forward, uh, we meet on a weekly basis to discuss this website and if you, feel, uh, if you feel like you'd really like to get involved, by all means let us know, come to the conversation uh, and help us make this better. If you give me your address, I'll put your name in our database, you'll get our newsletter, which comes out at least once a month. Uh, we don't, we have a policy of not pestering people. We don't just send you emails every, you know, three minutes. Uh, we send them out uh, on as needed, but we keep the as needed piece minimal. So you won't get five emails a day from us, I promise you. And then like us on Facebook. Uh, we have a very active page. In fact, we were just honored yesterday, uh, Chelsea and uh, our communications manager Brooke went out and gave a pitch on social media because we're recognized as actually developing and having something worthwhile there and, and having, uh, having good communication to weigh on that. So, let's get into the actual site itself. Now if you have a laptop or a pad or you want to follow along here, you can go to imaginegreatertucson.org slash trip. Let's see. So there we are. Um, at this point, this is where I'd really like you all to uh, start giving me some feedback um, on how these things look or you know, if you've got a question you want to look at a particular stat. That's the site itself. It's live. We don't advertise it uh, openly, but it's easy for everybody to get to. Um, and the point of it is that uh, while we're in this sort of beta test phase, we, we want to kind of keep a conversation and, a little close. So as you see, as I said, across the top, you've got the uh, nine value areas. And then if you drill down to each of them, let's go to regional identity, for instance. A little description. And then the values themselves that uh, made up that value area. If we go into strong sense community, relaxed, fun, friendly feel, this is where you start getting into the data itself. So you can see how people are feeling about things over time, 2001 to 2004. Again, from American Community Survey, this is how people were reporting on what, what they felt about the region. And you can click on that and actually get a bigger you know, picture of it and, and see. So overall appearance of Tucson, I think it'd be easy to say that most people, that's probably right. It's gone downhill, and I'd like to see what uh, 2008 or uh, the, uh, a more recent snapshot would look like if people feel it like it's gone downhill. We go into quality neighborhoods. One of the things that we have been talking about is, you know, what really is a neighborhood? And people think of houses, people think of the ability to walk around and access it. But oftentimes they forget the fact that neighborhoods are also made up of businesses and provide that structure. Uh, a lot of our zoning in the past has prevented businesses from being a part of that neighborhood. Uh, but what does that do for really livability? And what does that do with your ability to age in place? So we ask these questions and we go and take a look at the well-planned and managed land use and growth, for instance. A 
as a value. When you look at our communities, you know, some of these some of these preferences here with walking and biking options, natural environment, public transit, clean air, cost efficient infrastructure, you know, how does that relate to our ability to live and actually enjoy? And so these are just again some of the indicators that we see out there, but you can slice it up by particular uh, factors. You can include a number of different ones and just play with it. It allows you the interactivity on the site to, 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 uh, to really use it and drill down again to your particular zip code. So any thoughts so far? This is getting really easy. <laughs> well, I just want to point out um, the handout that you all have on this little packet here. This actually has each of the values, um, each of the 60, and it also has the indicator that we used and the data that's measured. So this is sort of a map of what's on the website right now. And in previous workshops, what we've done is we've asked people to either visit the website physically or use this map as a, as a means of saying, OK, if this is what it's measuring, is that the right measure? Is there a better measure we could use for that indicator? Um, are we using the right indicator? Uh, what sources are missing? Um, a lot of the information that we have on this website is uh, from free sources, government resources, um, community resources. Some of it, um, we had a volunteer that was kind enough to um, access for it through a paid um, source. A paid service, yeah. yeah. But, um, we're, we're, it's very much a work in progress, and we know that this is not a holistic view right now, but our goal is to get there, and so our big ask, I think, today is to have you all um, explore the website and, and look at some of the things that we're trying to measure and trying to um, share information about and see, um, maybe it's, is it convoluted? Is it not enough? Is it, does it make sense to just the average person? Um, these are the things that we really want to make sure that it's an accessible tool for anyone in the region and they can go to it, they see it, they understand it, and if they want, they can get involved with that cause or celebrate the progress that we've made. But the more input that we can get, the more ideas that we can get, the better the tool that it will be. You know, one of the more interesting pieces of this, in, t in, in 2011, so two years ago, we commissioned a random survey uh, to see how the people felt we were dealing, uh, what we were doing in these areas. And uh, you, you see some interesting results if you take a look at this. One of my favorite, and we, we have it up here in the actual text, is um, there's significant disagreement in some of these areas, like climate change. We have 32% <laughs> of the population thinks we're doing well in addressing the impacts of climate change, while 33% think we're doing poorly at it. You've got these diametrically opposed uh, positions. And, 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 and so, you know, you see here where the, where the the relationship is just weird and we wonder why. So we'd have to ask, are we, what do we mean when we say addressing the issues of climate change or the impacts of climate change? What are those uh, performance criteria uh, that we're using and are they in fact realistic? And uh, again, we'd love to have feedback on that because the more conversations like this we have, uh, the better off the site's going to be and the more useful as a tool it'll be for everybody. So what can you do about climate change? <laughs> well, again, it's about addressing the impacts of climate change. I mean, the, the fact is, little bitty Tucson and even little little bitty or IGT isn't going to do a whole lot uh, to change the weather patterns. But what we can do is talk about what are we going to do as a region to deal with that. It's like dealing with monsoons or traffic or anything else. How are we going to deal with the fact that it's getting hotter and it's going to get hotter? And, and, and you know, that's going to affect our weather. We're not going to have as great a monsoon season. Drought's going to be a problem. Water, um, for instance, uh, the state reckons that we're going to tap out at, at our ability to support people here in this region at about 2.2 million. Okay, so we can double the number of the population and then Arizona cap water just is not going to handle it anymore. We, we're, we're, the the, the 2.3 millionth person is going to have to give up on bathing. How are we going to deal with that? 
Are we going to come up with a growth policy that restricts that by water usage? Are we going to try to find other sources? That's probably not realistic. Uh, are we going to look at the efficiency of our water system so that we're not losing as much back into the environment and we're focusing it more into the houses? I mean, there's a number of things that we can do. Uh, automobiles. Uh, what well, before we leave yeah. water, yeah. is anything meaningful being done right now besides beat the peak? <laughs> um, not that I see. Not that I see, realistically. I mean, we, because of the fact that it is not a problem yet, we tend to deal with things when they become super problems and ignore them until that point. And because it is not a problem, we do have Arizona cap water, uh, then it's, you know, they're, they're happy pushing it aside. What's funny though to me, specific to water, is water is one of the most heavily subsidized things that we have, things that are provided to us. If we were paying the true cost of that glass of water coming out of the tap, uh, there'd be a revolt. Uh, people don't understand that. Yet, at the same time, the same people that are happy to get that water heavily subsidized will turn around and complain about the fact that uh, the bus system, you know, Suntran, isn't profitable. Well, neither is your water system. If you're going to apply that measure across all the services that we provide, let's be realistic about it. Or let's take understand that public systems are for the public good and that they're not carnival rides. You know, let, you don't have to pay the true price of them. Let's have that conversation and understanding equally across all of the services. Um, but I did want to talk real quick about transportation. Uh, if you go elsewhere into our site and you look at the vision that we painted for them, good to see you. Oh, good to see you. If we look at the, the vision that we painted for uh, the region and what that actually looked like, and I'm going to get there here shortly, it re we, we, we proposed a much more condensed, much more uh, less spread out, I should say, future than the one that we're currently heading towards. So no more communities out in the middle of the desert. Let's focus them around the places where people already live and let's come up with some more compact living choices. And that in fact is what the people told us they wanted to have. They wanted to be able to live in apartments downtown for instance. Uh, not that everybody's going to live in an apartment downtown, but there are folks that do want it and they want to have that option available to them. And right now it's not realistically there. Um, try to there we go. The uh, sorry, I lost my place <laughs> very quickly. The uh, but what that resulted in when they did an analysis of it, a, a traffic analysis of it, was a 29 percent reduction in vehicle miles traveled. And think about that for a moment. If we're driving 29 percent less miles, not only is that less gas and wear and tear on our own individual cars, but that's less infrastructure that we have to build that is less road maintenance that we have to maintain at the public expense, that is less water, less piping, less loss to entropy, uh, it's less emissions, and that's where I was getting at with uh, the, the environmental piece. And the other thing is uh, it's, it's less time. It's more back to the individual, so you're not spending all that time in your car commuting in, you're able to use that in, in any other way that's far more profitable than just sitting in your car spewing emissions. Getting the wrong things here. Tell me, Chelsea, I'm off. Are you trying to go? I am trying to. I'm trying to find our map that shows the uh, uh, the different visions, the different options. Go back to the website. Okay. There we are. And I believe it's under. Knowledge, either vision and values or knowledge exchange. Okay, vision and plan. There we are. Where is it in here? Okay. It's in the actual vision document. Down. Down. Yeah. yeah. Is that vision and values? Yes, here we are. Scrolling there. Yeah. There we are. Okay. So if you take a look at this option here, for instance. Oh. 
It's not letting me blow up on it. All right. We can see. Dang it. Can I turn off those other lights, or? Sure. Okay. Okay. Thanks, sir. Actually, I can use the cursor to point. All right. So if we looked at, if we did nothing, if we just continued to grow as we grow right now, all of those areas that are in, in sort of that gold color right here, that's where housing would spread to. It would eat up 311 square miles of desert for the next million people. That's an awful lot of single family homes. It's an awful lot of, of roads. That's an awful lot of infrastructure to spread people out in the desert. And what's interesting is this block here is the Tohono O'odham Nation. This is three points out here, and you can, still, you can see we're actually talking about uh, development out that far. And that's nice if you want that kind of lifestyle, and we're not saying that you can't build homes out there, but for the most part, that's not what people want. What we looked at instead on the far right was a much more condensed version of, uh, of what people were looking for with settlement around Marana, Oro Valley, Tucson itself and some of the more heavily settled parts of Tucson and out east, Vail, Sorita, and Green Valley. And so our, our view was to concentrate things around those towns or those areas that already exist or are already growing in that way. And let's not have settlement patterns way out here that far away. And that's the difference, that's the 29% difference. By the way, that, uh, the, the next million people that moved in, if we adopted this kind of settlement pattern, would, uh, would take up only less than 100 square miles, additional square miles of desert. And again, for an environmental point of view, that's much better and a much easier service delivery area when you're looking at water or transportation or just groceries uh, and our ability to, uh, to support ourselves. So that really is the difference that we're looking for. So, thoughts, questions? We can turn the lights back on, I guess, huh? Would it be useful to you? Is this something that y'all can use? It's it's overwhelming. I mean, it didn't, yeah. it's a lot of stuff to look at. I, know. I don't think it's convoluted or anything, but I'm just taking it all in, you know. Sure. <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, so you're saying we're losing the 20-something generation. Mm -hmm. um, I just losing found you. out. Yeah, I just found out that the U of A, the freshman class at U of A, is the largest in history. So are we? Wait, how exactly is that gauge? Exactly, is it just? How many of those? They're coming from other it, places they're and coming, they're going they're just, back they're home. Coming, there are other people coming here for school and leaving, or is it? That's or exactly we, that. probably it, like a it, good way and to it's, do it. It's not only the people that, we're not, that are passing through that we're not retaining, but it's our own. Right. Uh, the very first, uh, at the beginning of IGT, before we even were IGT, before we even had a name, uh, we grew out of a uh, Arizona town hall uh, back in 2008, I believe. It was sponsored by the Southern Arizona Leadership Conference. And uh, the question that people were asked at that town hall was, what are some of the biggest problems that we're facing? You know, why, why are we in the state we're in? And the answer overwhelmingly was, we're losing our kids. They're going off to Portland or Austin or San Antonio or anywhere else. And it wasn't to New York and Chicago. It was to other cities, peer cities Phoenix like ours. Phoenix is pretty big too, which you didn't mention. I mean, a lot of people, yeah. I know, you know, we're, we both grew up here, and a lot of people who went to Phoenix who didn't want to, yeah. you know, for the opportunity. Yeah, and, and well, I, I look at Chelsea here. My staff is largely exactly the demographic that we want to keep. Mm -hmm. Young, you know, recently graduated from the University of Arizona, and, and they're actually trying to stay here. You know, uh, Chelsea uh, from Phoenix, why is she here? Why has she not left? because her significant other, her half, has found a job at the university that pays well, that you know, provides benefits and things, and so she's kind of trapped. But nonetheless, you know, does it provide the option she will ask her? Chelsea, where would you rather live? 
Phoenix. <laughs> or what was the other choice? Denver. Yeah. You know, so it's not, again, it's not, it's not the people running off of L.A. and New York like they were in the 1950s and 60s for the, for the wonderful life. They're actually just finding other environments that could be very much like Tucson elsewhere mm -hmm. because it provides that. Yeah, I'm involved with Star Tucson, and we're, we have this conversation all the time, too. And I think a lot of it, the things that are going to make it better are happening, you know, with the downtown is taking off. We, just, we need more companies, more jobs for young people, better jobs. But I think it's a lot better than it was five years ago. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I like talking about downtown because, well, we live and work downtown, uh, or at least work downtown. Um, and what has happened there has, has happened almost in spite of government. What we're trying to do is work with the local governments, each of the cities, each of the towns, to remove the barriers that make it difficult to do exactly what's been done. It is, if, if you want to uh, build a space, I don't care what it is, a fun retail space, uh, a nightclub, or even just a good apartment, it is hard to do that because of the rules and regulations we've allowed to accrue over the past 50, 60 years. It is much easier to go outside the city limits into the county and just build something brand new. And because business, let's face it, you want predictability, you want to be able to know what that outcome is going to be, you want to know what the process is in order to make it happen and not have any muss and fuss over it, and time is money, let's just go outside the, 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 the county or outside the city into the county. That's not going to help. That just creates more places out in the middle of nowhere uh, and creates this lifestyle where we're dependent on cars to get back and forth. The better reality is let's change those rules. Let's make it possible. Let's make it just as easy for a developer to take, take some, some, some crumbling old space that could really be cool but is unusable because of codes and, and restrictions that have put, been put there over time. Take away those codes and restrictions or at least change them enough to make it just as easy for them to take that and build it up. Uh, Ice House Lofts, for instance. Uh, or the, uh, I'm trying to remember the space on Broadway right next to Hotel Congress that used to be uh, it used to be really uh, uh, retirement apartments uh, and subsidized, and now it's been turned into market rate apartments, where Spark Root is, that area there. Yeah. The Riley Pizza place. Yeah, Riley Pizza, yeah. That, how long was that building vacant, and how long did it take them, for, for heaven's sake, it took them like five years from the time they bought that thing to be able to start building on it yeah. because of all the restrictions. But someone had a vision, and they made it happen, and now it's very, very cool. Uh, that's exactly what we're trying to do and promote that. Uh, and, and then also it's a lot of taking away the fear of people who have lived here for a long time and have seen things gone horribly wrong or had a great idea that never happened. Taking away that fear that it's okay to have a Trader Joe's down the street where you can walk to or pick, pick, pick a retail place. It's all right. That's, that's a good thing to have happen. Uh, and, and other questions, like what do you do with these schools that are closing down? Do we just mothball them and allow them just to be boarded up in eyesores, or do we try to find a way to use those in really cool ways? Um, there's a American Communities, I'm trying to think of the name of the organization, uh, American Communities Trust. Just started a brand new, I think you can go to the website, I think it's up and running. I mean, they've, they're making proposals to actually lease these closed down schools and turn them into community centers or retail spaces or something neat, and then use the playgrounds and the yards outside as community gardens. But something would be productive and sponsored by the community. And by the way, the idea would be the community comes in and tells people, tells the government what they want that to be. So each one would look different based on the needs of that particular community. What a great idea. Let's at least have that conversation and talk about it. Um, but yeah, we haven't had that. You know, what's happened here for a long time is that a segment of our community comes up with a bright idea. And it may be, in fact, a really good idea. But it gets so stovepiped that it never goes to the people, or seldom goes to the people. And so business community gets excited about something, they'll take it to government, government will put it on the ballot, they get all excited about it, it goes out to the people for a vote to fund, and the people never heard about it, and it's been misexplained, or somebody's demagogued it, and now it gets voted down. And so what was a great idea becomes nothing. So you get jaded over time. And, and we run into this all the time. Why, do, why, should, we why should we do this again? We, we beat our heads against that wall. Because if we don't, it ain't going to get better. That's why we do it again. So is TUSD entertaining any uh, ideas about what to do with the closed schools? I, I think so. I don't know where American Communities Trust is on their project. Uh, we talked to them back in January, and uh, we said, absolutely, this is something we would, I think would be a great thing to support. Let us know what we can do. 
We just haven't had the follow-on conversations. And I know they were looking to close on at least a project sometime in the spring, but I need to follow back up with them and see where they are. But it would be, I think it'd be a wonderful thing to see. When Much you say close, close a project, project, you mean? Close on the deal. Oh, okay. Actually have one <laughs> working, sorry. Close is a bad word in this context. <laughs> I, yeah. They were gonna close the deal. Okay. Right. Seal the deal. Seal the deal, there we are. Better words. Are you familiar with the apartments that are just west of um, uh, Fourth Avenue? The ones that were placed right, Dairy Queen. Avenue? Are you talking the new ones? The, the, uh, There's like a Muse Center there, I think. The, and, uh, yeah, you're talking about what's right behind Dairy Queen? Yeah, the right, district. Right, right behind Dairy Queen? Yeah. Did they get red tagged or for over student did or I don't exactly know. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they've been red tagged as, as a whole. I'm not sure about that. I haven't heard anything. But I do know that the the West University uh, neighborhood is really unhappy about them, and it's not. It, it's not so much that they don't expect students to live there, but the concentration and the way that they built uh, that particular development, the the city ski, it, it, it's out of context with the rest of the neighborhood, and so architecturally, it looks a bit out of place. Um, and just lifestyle, now you've got all these students there and they didn't really plan on how to deal with them very well. Uh, and that, that, that bothers them because you've got a residential neighborhood and then, you know, I don't know how many students live there, but let's just say 200 kids suddenly in the middle of it. That changes your, your pattern of life a bit. I know when it, when it first opened they were having more problems and then the management kind of came down on them, the management of the building to save themselves and kind of made it tougher so I don't think it's as big a deal with the party and stuff. I, I honestly, other than the conversation around it, and, and that's only like three blocks behind my office, I pass by it. I, we make a practice of, of supporting our neighborhood and, and, and shopping and eating, eating in the places you know, that are around us. Um, so I've walked by that probably three times a week at least. And I haven't really seen anything that looked out of sorts, other than the fact that it is kind of an eyesore. Uh, there it is. I appreciate your time. Thank you. We appreciate you guys coming out to Gangplank. Well, I, the more I actually find out about this, the more happy I am that y'all are here. So. Well, we're going to do bigger and better things downtown with you. <laughs> we look forward to it. When, do you, when are you going to move, by the way? Uh, the next estimate is the end of this month. Oh, cool. Yeah. Are you going to have like a, a, a housewarming party? I'm sure we will. Okay. Well, let us know. We'll come down and, okay. uh, and eat your stuff. All right. <laughs>